Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining this session, uh, Redis Crash Course for Artificial Intelligence and Machine Learning. My name is Timur Rashid, and I'll be your host for today's session. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the Data Science Dojo team for organizing this session. Now, before I introduce our speakers, let me say a few words about the session. This is a crash course for beginners with no prior experience in Redis, and it's intended for machine learning and data engineers, as well as data scientists making the transition from theory to applied science. We will be recording the session and I'll be moderating, moderating the Q&A session that we have towards the end. So please submit your questions in the chat window uh, or on YouTube. Since we have a live stream, uh, we will be collecting questions and posting them here on the Zoom webinar. Uh, for those questions we're unable to answer during the live session, we'll capture them and send answers along when we send the recording via email. We will be issuing out certificates of attendance and those will be available towards the end of the webinar. So it's my pleasure to introduce our two speakers for this session. Uh, first, I'd like to introduce uh, Simon Prickett. He is the manager of developer advocacy at Redis. Uh, Simon is an experienced systems architect, technical trainer, technical blogger, mentor, product manager, and developer advocate. In his spare time, he enjoys tinkering with Raspberry Pi and Arduino single board computers and building hardware projects with them. Simon, welcome. Thank you very much, Simon. Next, I'd like to introduce Nava Levy. She is the uh, developer advocate for data science and ML ops at Redis. Uh, Nava started her career in tech uh, with the R&D unit at the IDF and had the good fortune to work with and champion cloud, big data, artificial intelligence, and machine learning uh, throughout her career, right when the wave of these technologies was just starting. Nava is also a mentor at the Mass Challenge Accelerator and a founder of an edtech venture called Lurgo. So without further ado, I'll hand it over to Nava and she'll begin the presentation. Nava, it's all yours. Thanks very much, uh, Taimur and Nathan for hosting us. Um, so um, before uh, I begin, I'll just uh, go over a little bit uh, uh, of um, what we're gonna cover today. Um, so, and maybe before that, it's, you know, I'm very happy to be here and to presenting this and thank you everyone uh, for joining this session. Um, so we'll start by setting the context, then we are, we're gonna talk about key concept for a NoSQL in-memory database. We talk about the operational aspects of deploy deploying real-time AI. We'll talk about Redis as the infrastructure for online feature store. Uh, we'll give an introduction to Redis search and then talk about Redis as vector database for neural search and, and summary and then Q&A. Now, uh, as uh, Taimur said, in this session, you don't need any knowledge uh, with Redis. It's really for beginners with Redis, but we do expect you to have some basic uh, uh, understanding of the data science uh, concepts. Uh, and if you are an experienced data scientist looking to transition uh, to apply data science, this is also for you, as well as if you are experienced MLOP engineer or data engineer, uh, but you're now uh, moving to real-time AI ML or, or looking to scale your real-time AI, then this is also a good session for you. This presentation is not for people who are looking for a deep dive tutorial on Redis. Now, at the end of the presentation, we are going to uh, refer you to some resources where you can find a deep dive uh, tutorials on Redis, but, but this is just, you know, a brief uh, uh, introduction to Redis. And this is not a session for Redis developers looking for a machine learning 101 session. If you are looking for such a session, let us know and we'll be happy to accommodate as well. And uh, so let's start with setting the context. context. And I'll start with uh, uh, going over some of the hottest trends in AI and machine learning, defining what real-time AI is, and the uh, overview of the key focus areas for Redis in AI. So what are the hottest trends in uh, AI or machine learning today? And I'm using the term AI and ML interchangeably. So across use cases, uh, I would say it's real-time uh, machine learning. And uh, when we say real-time machine learning, we mean use cases 
like fraud prevention or like recommendation that really need to be uh, delivered the predictions in, in milliseconds very, very fast. And uh, if we want to define better what we mean by real time, then it's serving prediction upon receiving an online request from an operational system or as the user interacts with the website or the application, let's say does a search, and it's based on live, fresh, real-time data. So not data from a day ago or maybe four minutes ago, but live, fresh data from streaming sources, a click stream, uh, my location, the last transactions, uh, etc. And doing it extremely fast with a very low delay or what we call latency. And we measure this latency in milliseconds. And milliseconds is one thousandth of a second. And uh, a cost, so this is the cost use cases, real-time AI ML. We see uh, that uh, the trend towards real-time AI ML, you know, is uh, very strong. Uh, the, the more real-time the use cases are, the more value they have, the more mission critical they are. Across data science, I would say that the most exciting thing that is happening, especially in applied data science, is embeddings, those, those dense vector representation that imbue the meaning, the deeper, uh, deeper meaning of the object that they embed, that they represent, and, uh, and uh, they are used for a number of use cases, and we'll talk more about one of them. And this is really an exciting uh, area. And for machine learning operations or MLOps, which is the bridge between uh, um, data science or the machine learning model and the operation, same as DevOps, then the feature store is the cornerstone of MLOps plat platform and, and, and is an emerging uh, to be a very important uh, component. And so this, we're going to also going to touch about that, talk about that. And for Redis in real time, AI, Basically, uh, we, are, we have two focus areas. One is in the intersection of embeddings and real-time AI, which is vector similarity search or neural search. And for feature store, the intersection between feature store and real-time AI ML, it's online feature store, uh, serving features very fast for prediction. So these are the two focus areas that we are gonna talk about uh, today and for Redis. And doing this, um, you know, at scale and in very, very quickly is difficult. And in general, it's difficult to deploy uh, machine learning to production, but it's even much harder to deploy real-time AI ML because you have to do all this very, very quickly and not, not, and not cause any bottlenecks. And this is why we see that uh, a lot of uh, machine learning models never make it to production or or crash and burn after they're deployed in production. And really uh, what we see when we look at the successful companies that deployed uh, their AI ML uh, for real-time use cases at scale is that they have a stack, a technology stack that is built for, for, for speed, uh, ground up, and they're leveraging, leveraging best practices uh, uh, in, in this area. And uh, Redis is such a, a stack that is built for speed. And with that, I'll hand over the presentation uh, to, to Simon uh, to talk about key concepts um, around um, this Redis uh, NoSQL and key value store. Simon? Thanks, Nava. So yeah, what we're going to talk about in this segment is a brief introduction to Redis, what key value data storage is, um, and why keeping things in memory can be important. So next slide, please. So what is Redis? It's a key value data store, which may be different from uh, other types of database that you've worked with before, such as a relational database. Um, one of its unique or special features is that a copy of the entire data set is kept in memory. So all the reads will come from memory. This means that it's extremely fast. However, it's also a safe place to keep your data because you can configure persistence and you can have persistence operate on a schedule or for every transaction or in any way that you choose so that you can choose um, how much durability you want and when versus keeping that speed. But all the reads will always come from memory. It's a server, so like other database products, it's accessible across the network. Um, 
And what the picture in the background here shows is how I sort of like to explain Redis to people. So here we have a woman and she's working at the Library of Congress in Washington, DC in the 1970s. This is their indexing system. And it's a sort of key value store. So in order to know um, which set of book cards she uh, wants to access, she needs to know some information that's written on those white labels in the front of each drawer. So if you imagine Redis as a huge uh, array of boxes and each one of those things can have a name on it, then the way that you get at the data is by knowing that name. Um, and we'll see how that could be a limitation in some cases and also how that can be overcome and, and become an advantage again. So next slide, please. So why should you learn Redis? Is it some like niche thing that you can spend time on learning it and you'll um, never get any payback from it? Absolutely not. Um, it's extremely fast, so it can usually speed up any sort of application stack you're working with or enable use cases that weren't previously possible, especially those that require real-time or near real-time data processing. Um, it's open source, so you can inspect the source code. It's available in the cloud, so if you want to get it um, and operate it without having to deal with installing and managing and scaling it, you can do that. The main reasons you, you might want to get it as a developer would be it's unbelievably popular and developers actually love it. So we have over 4 billion downloads from Docker Hub of the core Redis product. And for the last four to five years, uh, Redis has won the Stack Overflow Developer Survey for most loved database. It's the number one key value data store on dbengines.com as well. And one thing that I always tell people is, one reason to learn Redis is you've possibly got it already. If you look around any sort of mature um, systems architecture, the chances are you'll find Redis in there as a session store or a cache or possibly a primary database. Um, next slide, please. So we said Redis is a key value data store. Um, if you've looked at other key value data stores, such as memcached, then you'll know that basically we're going to perform get and set operations. So here I can set a, a key called cat to a value called mocker. So I can store cat's name mocker in the key cat. And then I can set a key called dog to latte. And we start to get this sort of box thing going on of, you know, here's all the keys and their values. And then when I do get cat, then I can retrieve the value that we stored in cat back out of Redis and you know, we'll get mocker back, uh, which is kind of what we expect. So we'll look at how Redis differs from other key value stores where this is kind of what you get. So Redis has a lot more than just this uh, sort of table states behavior. Next slide, please. So if you're familiar with other database models, the chances are you've used a relational database. So let's look at how uh, Redis key value store compares to modeling the same thing in a relational database such as SQLite. So first thing over there on top left with SQLite, I'm creating a table. So something I want to store records that have the same schema in. So I'm creating a table called animals. And I have a couple of fields in there, species and a name. They're both text fields. I want to put string type values in there. Now I can do a couple of insert statements and add my values to those uh, columns in the table. And I retrieve them by doing a select query. So I can do select name, the thing that I want back from animals where the species is a cat. And we'll basically get mocker back because that's the only row in the table where species is cat. So compare and contrast that to Redis in the bottom right. The first thing you'll notice is I just set something. So I'm going to use a, a key naming strategy here. I'm going to use animals colon as a prefix for my keys because I'm storing uh, things about animals in keys that begin with that. So I'm going to say animals colon cat, which is a bit of information I have. Set that value to mocker. Uh, there's no create step here. It just does it. So we haven't uh, created a schema. It's a sort of schemaless NoSQL database. We haven't used SQL. Um, we just set the value. So I can do the same with the dog there, set the dog to latte. And when I do get animals cat, again, you'd expect you get mocker back as you'd expect. Uh, next slide, please. And the chances are, even if you're not working with a key value database product, you're probably working with something that looks like a key value store already. So this won't be too unfamiliar to you. If you're a Python programmer and you've used dictionaries, or if you're a Node or JavaScript programmer and you use objects, both of those things are kind of associative arrays, which is what Redis is kind of a big associative array. 
So we're associating names with values. So over there in Python, I can um, start with an empty dictionary, add values to it. Those essentially get keys and I can retrieve them if I know the key. Similarly in JavaScript. And next slide, please. What sets Redis apart from a lot of other key value stores is that strings aren't the only thing that you can put in there. Um, you can put in hashes, which are something that approximate to an associative array or an object themselves. You kind of put a mini Redis inside Redis. Uh, you can store lists, which are doubly linked lists. If you remember those from computer science, they're useful for building queues or uh, stacks or other similar data structures. Redis supports a set, which is great for deduplicating values or seeing if we've seen a value before in a long stream of values. Uh, it also supports streams. So for AI purposes, if you're ingesting a lot of data very, very quickly and you want a, something that can keep up with that, Redis streams are ingested into memory first and then persisted. So the ingestion is extremely fast. Um, I'll cut over the rest of the um, data types, but those are the data types in open source Redis. And then if we go to the next transition, please. What you'll see is that in Redis Enterprise, which is a cloud product that you can sign up for, or you can install it in your own infrastructure, we add additional capabilities. And we'll look at a couple of those today. So um, we had a graph database. So you can do cipher queries, time series, again, for more sort of IoT uh, big data applications. You can do aggregation down sampling. Uh, we had some more probabilistic data structures, which are great for large data sets because they're a very efficient way of approximating counts of things or if something's present. What we'll look at today is the ability to do uh, complicated searches over data in Redis and see how that um, works in some AI use cases. So next slide, please. So one of the things we're going to look at is how to store data in hashes in Redis. So I said before, that's like storing an associative array inside a key in Redis. So it's like a little Redis in a big Redis. Um, and the example I'm going to run with in my segments is imagine I've got some adoptable animals. I'm an animal shelter. And I want to store some information about them. So in the key adoptables, colon 1001, that's like my animal ID. Uh, I've got a dog called Charlie, and he's 13. And in key adoptables 1002, I've got a cat called Luna, um, and Luna is black. And we don't have to store the same data in the two hashes. So the field names inside the hash can be anything we like. There is no schema here. So two things, this is very flexible, uh, but also it means our application needs to learn to expect you know, data may be missing or different and cope with that. Next slide, please. So really quickly, I'm just going to show one of uh, Redis's sort of core tricks, if you like, the things it's most known for, which is the ability to cache data and explain why that's uh, important too. So I'm going to share my screen here, and we are going to take a look at Redis Insight here. So this is a tool for uh, interacting with Redis. It's sort of like a REPL. If you're familiar with Python or Node, I can type commands, and Redis will execute them. And one of the things that is important with a database sometimes is quite often you buy a database on durability, the ability to keep something and never lose it. Sometimes, conversely, it's important to forget things. So when you're using your database as a cache, so you want to keep a, a quickly available local copy of something that either costs a lot of money to generate or took a lot of compute time, or maybe it's calling an API that you've got a limit on and you don't want to call it too often then you want a data store that can remember that for a while and then forget it. And then you go back to the origin, do the calculation again, or get the data again. So imagine that I'm storing weather, and I've got a weather API that costs me money. So I've got the weather for the city of Sheffield in the UK. So I might want to do set expire in Redis and do key name weather Sheffield. And we'll store it for 15 seconds. And we'll say it's rainy in Sheffield at the minute. So that's my API call, if you like. If I then do get weather share field, and I've got to be quick, um, Redis comes back and says, yeah, it's raining. Um, and then if we talk this out a little bit, and I do that again, it's still rainy, and we try again after some other time has passed, nil. So this means that Redis has forgotten about that because we told it to only remember it for 15 seconds. So this is quite important when you're building things that need like online data that's in memory, accessible really, really quickly. Um, 
and a configurable but slightly old version of the data is acceptable. Um, the database itself will manage expiring that, and then you can simply write some logic to say, go get it from the origin, put it back in Redis. So with those uh, fundamentals covered, I'm going to hand back to Nava and look at how some of that applies to AI ML use cases. We're going to want to do some coding as well with Redis. So here I'm looking at how to uh, write Python code that accesses a Redis data store. So we have a Redis client or SDK. I import that, create an instance of Redis at the uh, line three. And then I simply use uh, functions that map to Redis commands. So there's a command called hash set, hash set. I pass it the key that I want to store something in, and then a dictionary of what I want to store in there. Again, there's no schema here. So I could put anything in that dictionary. And adoptables 1002 doesn't have to have any of these fields at all. It could be a completely separate data object. And if I want to get things out again, we've got hm get, h multiple get fields. So I pass it a key name, a couple of fields that I want to get, and I can get just those data values back. So if that hash becomes very big, I can optimize my query like you would in SQL by just getting the things I want and not doing the equivalent of a select star. So go to the next slide, please. Now I'll hand you back to Nava to look at how this applies to AI ML use cases. OK, thank you, Simon. Um, so what I'm going to talk now is uh, about aspects beyond accuracy. And uh, as a, a data scientist, we focus on accuracy. And also as a MLOps engineer, we want the, uh, to have a good accuracy with no data drift, concept drift. Uh, but we also focus on other considerations beyond, uh, beyond the accuracy. And, and I'm going to talk about the first one is uh, latency or how fast is real time. So if we look at the fraud detection, in the past, uh, I, I worked 10 years ago in a fraud detection company. So batch scoring done uh, every 24 hours was completely acceptable. And then uh, several years later, we moved the window to 40 minutes uh, batch scoring. Uh, and, and now uh, the batch scoring is done online and uh, it's from 200 milliseconds to 50 milliseconds. And we see that it's, it's getting more and more uh, stringent uh, requirements. And the reason is that the, the um, ML, uh, ML use case has to be integrated into a real-time uh, uh, application. So if the real-time application, 200 milliseconds is acceptable uh, latency, then we need to say if a transaction, for instance, for an e-commerce site is fraud or not with less than that. So this is why uh, it's so important to achieve this latency. And these are uh, just two examples uh, from uh, Redis uh, users, AT&T, uh, for fraud prevention, uh, 50 milliseconds uh, latency for scoring, and a kata for their transaction, uh, sorry, for their uh, um, uh, trans transaction risk API. Uh, the end-to-end the -end latency is 100 milliseconds. And it means that the, the database latency is much, much, uh, uh, the is, is, has to be much less than that. And we're going to talk about that. And it's not just about latency or, and also consistent latency. Also, the tail latency or P99 has to be very, very low. It's also high throughput. So high throughput, we mean number of queries per second. And it's not the same as the number of reads to the database. So one query could, could have hundreds of reads to the database, and it has to be at scale. So maybe it's uh, hundreds per second, maybe it's thousands per second, but it could be also millions per second and billions per second. And it has to be easy to manage uh, at scale, because when we, we, we scale, we need more clusters. Uh, um, it's important to have a, a, a system that is easy to scale and that supports different data types and structures, as Simon mentioned earlier. Uh, and often we we'll want it to be globally distributed, distributed either from regulation perspective or from a disaster recovery perspective, or again, from a latency perspective, ach achieving local latency and scaling cost effectively for real-time uh, AIML use cases at scale 
the cost can be quite significant. So any efficiencies and, and cost savings that we can introduce uh, can be substantial. And it, it has to be uh, highly available, especially uh, when it's mission critical application or customer facing uh, application or use cases, then, uh, then high availability is very important. It also uh, highly persistent, so no data is lost. So these are some of the operational considerations beyond accuracy, which is also very important that we have to uh, make sure we, we comply with uh, when deploying, deploying real-time AI ML. And with that, let's talk about Redis as for online feature store or serving features at the speed of Redis, you know, in memory, a key value store. So this is a typical data pipeline for real-time AI. We have the raw data coming in. It could be batch sources from your data warehouse and most importantly, streaming sources. These are the live fresh data. So it could be click streams or uh, data from, from IoT sensor. It could be from your server logs. It could be from the transactions. And all of the, and those, those uh, um, raw data have to go through transformation of what we call feature engineering. And uh, so we need to extract the data. We need to transform and load it into the uh, fast uh, online storage to store, store and serve features for online inference with very low latency. And then we need to extract those features for online scoring. Now, each one of those component uh, now that I marked in red, is very important. Uh, and each one of them, we need to reduce the latency as much as possible if it's for the streaming transport and the, st and the computation of transformation. And if it's for the extracting the features that we're using, a Java gRPC server or Lambda function or, or a HTTP a Python server, all of them have implication. The feature engineering is it done in, uh, in the transformation? Is it Spark, Flink, Kafka? Uh, for, for, the, for the inferencing, are we using accelerators? So for all of this we can optimize, but what we found that the biggest uh, source for uh, improvements and also the, the potential for bottleneck is actually the online a data store uh, because it has to be done in very low latency and not complying with this latency is it can become a bottleneck uh, for the for real time uh, AI use cases and uh, and uh, this um, uh, component is often most often uh, uh, Redis is used for it especially for for uh, low latency or high throughput use cases at scale. And, and if you ask why, why, why is Redis uh, most often selected uh, for this uh, important uh, component for the real-time data layer, then uh, I would uh, refer you to the many benchmarks that are being done uh, by the users of Redis, whether it are feature stores like the, the popular open source uh, feature store Feast or commercial, commercial store Tekton or, or, uh, or uh, uh, end user Uber and DoorDash here. And um, I'm not going to read all of it. You can afterwards look at the recording and pause. But generally, uh, they uh, compare Redis to other key value store. Uh, and, uh, and, they, and they measure latency and throughput, as well as cost. And, they, and, of, and always, uh, consistently, Redis is the most performance and, and the least uh, and, and, um, and the much, much uh, less expensive. So here we can see that uh, from the Tekton benchmark, uh, comparing uh, uh, DynamoDB to Redis Enterprise. So Redis Enterprise is three times faster, as well as 14 times less expensive than DynamoDB. So I think that the data pretty much speaks for itself. And um, if we, the last um, uh, benchmark was from DoorDash, you can see that uh, if, if you look at the case study, one of the case studies of Dodash, that actually the online feature store is part of a component that is made up of online store and offline store, together called a feature store. And uh, it's emerging uh, as, uh, as the, to becoming the cornerstone of machine learning uh, operations. And uh, it's not just about serving features for real-time predictions with low latency, although I would argue that this is probably the most important objective because without 
disability, then there isn't really a real-time AI ML deployed to production. But there are other uh, important objectives for the feature store, and that is why it's becoming the cornerstone of machine learning operations. And the second one is avoiding the training serving skew. Uh, features defined differently in the training pipeline compared to the serving pipeline. And as a result, the accuracy in production uh, is, isn't as good as in training, and uh, it's, that's the skew. And the way to avoid it is to define uh, the features uh, uh, on a logical level in the registry once for training and serving one source of truth. And th this way you avoid the training serving skew. And a byproduct of this is that once the feature is defined in the registry, uh, it can be also reused across uh, use cases by the same data scientist who created the feature, but or by another data scientist it's because uh, feature engineering is, is probably 80% of the work of a data scientist or a data engineer. It's very important uh, to become much more efficient with it. And the feature store helps uh, a data scientists become much more efficient because they don't have to reinvent the wheel, create features that are actually shared across many use cases. Uh, and uh, the offline feature store, uh, it's not just Snowflake as a... As, uh, as DoorDash, it can be also a AWS S3, Redshift, Google BigQuery, a Microsoft SQL Azure, all are good um, options for the offline feature store. And the feature store the, uh, uh, is used for training and batch predictions and stores static and historical data. So there are no really no, no issue with latency, no latency uh, requirements. Uh, with, and the, the online feature store only stores the latest a feature of values, and it's a, a critical component, as we said, for real-time data a layer for machine learning and AI. And uh, it's not just about a, a latency, it's all of these a, operational requirements a, that, we, that I mentioned earlier are very important a, for a feature store, and you saw also that from the benchmarks. And um, all of it can be achieved with Redis a, open source, but once you you, and here I, I mentioned that Ekata uses a sorted sets data type at, uh, for their uh, online data store and DoorDash uses hashes. So you can see for different uh, use cases, uh, different uh, data types are, are, are better. Uh, but when we see that when, when, when customers want to scale the feature store to more use cases, larger data sets, higher throughput, then they often uh, go for Redis Enterprise and Redis Enterprise in the cloud, because then they can achieve all this, those other uh, benefits. Uh, so it's uh, with a fully managed solution, uh, it's easier to manage and scale, achieve nine, uh, five nine availability, uh, um, and all, uh, all, the, all the good things that you see here. Um, and in addition to the data types um, that, um, that we, we have, in, in, in Redis open source, there are also the other data structures like graph and, and JSON for documents and Redis search that we're gonna talk later on more. And uh, you can scale cost effect effectively. So for large data sets with Redis on flash, you can save up to 80% of the cost uh, by using tiered uh, memory with, between uh, DRAM and, uh, and flash and or SSD, and this is uh, very important because the online feature store at scale can become 50% or more of the total cost of your MLOps platform. So any, any savings that you can achieve here are significant and Ekata uh, saved uh, hundreds of thousands of do dollars annually and are still saving because uh, they're using a Redis Enterprise with Redis on Flash. Uh, so how can you get started? So Redis is only the infrastructure for the online feature store of the feature store. So you first need to have a feature store and you can build from scratch. You can start with open source and customize like the, the very popular uh, 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 open source uh, feature store of FIST uh, that is also with, uh, deployed on Azure and integrated with the Azure ecosystem. Uh, and, or you can uh, choose another open source uh, feature store like LinkedIn, just um, a short while ago, open source uh, their, their feature store. Uh, or you can buy or subscribe, and here are very good options uh, uh, of commercial feature stores. And 
And I also put some examples of uh, customers using each of those options. And some of them also have case studies that are available online. And we're gonna share with you those links at the end of the presentation that you can, you can look at them. But maybe the, the best way to get your, uh, you know, get hands on uh, quickly with Feature Store with Redis is using the uh, open source uh, Fist. And Redis is also open source. So you can, you know, start uh, 10 minutes after this session ends. And uh, there are great uh, uh, quick start tutorials that I'm going to talk about. Just to mention, you can see here the Fist architecture and the data infrastructure. And recently they added support for stream sources. And you know how we explained how important it is for real time use cases. And uh, uh, it's supported only for Redis, the streaming sources. Uh, and um, we have a Redis uh, plus, plus Fist quick start tutorial. There is a tutorial of uh, Fist on Azure, which is also very good. And Tekton just announced uh, their uh, support for Redis uh, Enterprise. So uh, you can also go to the Tekton website uh, to get uh, more information on that. And uh, with that, I would like to hand over the presentation back to Simon to talk about uh, Redis Search. Hello. So yeah, you've seen um, the ability to store things in Redis and retrieve them really, really quickly is great for things like feature stores where we know what we're retrieving. We're retrieving a feature and we know what it is and we know where we stored it so we can get it back again. Um, if we're going to do other sorts of um, AI, then we need something a bit more flexible than that. So let's have a look at what happens when we want to access data in Redis and it's not just getting something by key. So we don't either don't know the key or the answer, you know, having a key wouldn't help with that. So a really simple query, if you imagine my data set I had before, my adoptable animals at the shelter, um, somebody might want to say to us, well, what animals have you got in the shelter that are over nine years old? So with SQL, uh, SQLite and relational model, this is very easy. So again, I create my table. I have the fields I want, and I've got an additional field called age now that's an integer type. And I had some values, so Charlie's 13 and Luna, our cat, is 9. And then I've got a single query that I can say, get me everything from adoptables where the age field is greater than 9. And we find that that's Charlie the dog. Um, so problem solved there. If we move to the Redis key value model, and I put these things into hashes, so I H set adoptables 1001, which is my key, uh, name Charlie, species dog, age 13, and, and so on for Luna, then in order to get this data back, I've needed to use a key, but what key is going to answer the question, who's more than nine years old? Well, th there kind of isn't one in this setup. So this is, on the face of it, a problem. There's a couple of ways we can address this. So next slide, please. The first way that we would do this in um, open source Redis and traditionally is by a secondary index. So the application, when it stores something in one of these hashes against adoptables colon 1001, would also store it elsewhere in Redis using one of those other data structures or a combination of them according to what we're trying to achieve. So one of those data structures is called a sorted set. It maintains a a unique deduplicated collection of scores and uh, values. So in a single Redis key. So here I have a sorted set called animals colon by age. And I can put in the, whenever I store an animal in a hash, I'll also add the animal's age and the key name of where to get that animal. So the key name that holds the hash into the sorted set. Then the sorted set allows me to do range queries. So I can ask it, get me everything in the sorted set where the value is greater than nine, greater than 10, whatever I want it to be. And what I get back then is the keys of the hashes that those uh, animals data are really stored in. And I then have to go and do a H get all on each of those. So I now have a, like a two-step retrieval process, which is obviously a little bit slower than a single retrieval process. And I'm also maintaining these indexes in my application. So luckily, there's a better way than this. So next slide, please. Um, one of the capabilities of uh, Redis Enterprise and a module that you can add into Redis is something called Redis Search. So this adds full text uh, search, indexing, and querying languages over data in Redis. 
So we can keep all the benefits of that key value store and the speed of having the data in memory, but now we can write sort of more expressive queries and we can model our data in ways that we can do these sorts of range queries or full text searches or geo queries without knowing any keys. So you know, rather than sort of knowing where the answer is, we can ask Redis questions like, find me things that match these predicates. So here in Python, I'm using a client called Redis OM, which is a high level client for Redis, and it allows me to model things as classes. So I can say my adoptable uh, class looks like this. It has some fields. Um, so we are now creating some sort of a schema. And the reason for that is because we want Redis search to index it for us. So we have to tell it what fields to expect and what values go in there. We can actually store other values in those underlying hashes, but that'll be ignored by this, this model and these searches. They'll just exist in the data store alongside the indexed fields. So I'm defining a whole load of fields and I'm saying what type they are and whether I want to index them or not. So I have strings, a float, an int for the age. Um, and then down the bottom, I have a thing called description that I'm defining as a full text searchable field. So that's going to be like longer free text about, you know, what is our animal like? What traits have we observed while it's in the shelter? And people that want to adopt them might want to look for certain things in there. And we might want to do sort of fuzzy matches on that. So next slide, please. Once I've modeled my data like this for Redis search using the Redis home client, it's very easy in Python to then create um, instances of it. So as I saw before with using the hset command to put things in the hash, here I create an instance of that adoptable class. I pass it a dictionary of everything I want to store, and then I just call save on it. And the own client will persist that to Redis Redis search will update its index of um, things that it's watching over for us that match this schema. And it will do that automatically. That index is in memory, so it's also going to do that extremely quickly. So as soon as we save something, it's going to be available for querying. There won't be this lag between saving something and becoming available uh, as a query result. Next slide, please. So. That said, we can then use the uh, query language here to write way more expressive queries and do things that you wouldn't normally do with a key value store. So none of these queries here involve knowing any of the keys for where the data is persisted. So now I can basically say, find instances of my adoptable class at line four there where the name field is Luna, and I want all of them. That will get me every pet called Luna. I can then start to build up more complicated queries. So I can say, find things at line eight, where the species field is dog and the sex is male. So I want all the male dogs. I can do um, range queries. So line 13, we're looking for dogs where the age is greater than eight and also less than 11. So that's going to get me dogs that are nine and 10 years old. And I can sort them. And again, Redis will do all of this for us. And Redis search will track the underlying data set. So if other applications are changing the data set or other threads in my application are, the uh, search index is automatically updated. And the results will be uh, reflected accordingly. And down at the bottom, we can do sort of fuzzier queries, such as let's find all the cats that are good with children. And we have a, a number of things that make a cat good with children. So First off at line 18 there, the species has to be a cat and the children flag has to be yes. And then we're gonna look in that description field that we said to Redis, hey, do a full text search on that. And we're gonna find words that stem from play. So play, playing, playful. And then we're gonna exclude results where the description contains words that stem from anxious because we don't want a cat that's anxious around children. And where the words stem from nervous. So we don't want a nervous or an anxious cat. We do want a playful one, and we want it to also be a cat and have the children flag set to yes. So Redis Search is a technology that works over the data set in Redis and allows us to um, get around what looks like a, a limitation of a key value store whilst maintaining the advantage of that. We can basically write SQL like queries here and we have this incredible speed of if we have a data set that's changing in real time, the index will pretty much keep up with it because it's an in-memory index and the process is running right in the database that's indexing it. So to see how that enables more uh, AI functionality and capabilities with Redis, I'll hand back to Nava.
Thank you, Simon. Um, okay, so this was a, a great uh, uh, for the next topic, which is vector database and neural search, performing vector similarity search at the speed of Redis, which is another capability that Redis search uh, now enables. And so let's talk about a little bit uh, um, the background for it. So some of the big ideas or the most exciting developments uh, in, uh, in, in machine learning in recent years are, uh, you can see here. So deep learning and then transfer learning and uh, self-supervised learning and then attention mechanism, which laid the ground for transformers uh, in, in uh, 2017 and BERT in 2018. And then BERT being used for Google search uh, in 2019 and, and 220. And basically all of it um, led the, the, what to the next development, which is the rise of vector embeddings. And what are uh, our vector embeddings? They are learned dense vector representation of an object. So it could be, it started with text, with NLP, but today it's for image, speech, user profile, uh, DNA, or whatever. And it captures the deeper conceptual meaning of an object. And it has a characteristic that similar objects are close to each other in the vector space. Now, vector embeddings are used for uh, two uh, um, um, reasons. One in the training pipeline is input to a downstream, downstream model, often for transfer learning. And this is, uh, this is how it started. But in recent years, what we see that embeddings are also used to perform vector similarity search or, or neural search and uh, or, or sometimes called semantic search. Now, for both uh, of these um, uh, use cases, um, we, we need a, a, or we use thousands of embeddings or millions of embed embeddings and sometimes billions of embeddings. But there is one very big difference between the training pipeline and performing vector similarity search to power real-time application. One can be done in days or hours, and the, and the other one has to be done in a split second, in milliseconds. And this is very, very hard. And this led to a rise of a new category of databases called vector databases. And what they do is you need to load and store the embeddings very efficiently, then index the vector embeddings, which is a new capability for vector databases, and perform vector similarity search uh, balancing uh, speed with accuracy. Okay, so that's basically uh, the challenge of a vector database. And we are going to talk how Redis is now a, a Redis a, a, is a vector database with vector uh, similarity search capabilities. But before that, let's talk about some of the use cases that vector similarity search enables. So basically, it's it's a, it's a sky is the, the limit or the imagination or your imagination imagination. We see vector similarity search in many, many use cases across visual search, natural language search, e-commerce, whether it's a reverse image search, a face recognition, finding similar products a for a customer service, semantic search, Q&A, content recommendation, finding the right job for you or finding the right candidate. A, and a, for e-commerce, similar products, etc. Now, how is it done? So um, the first step is to generate the embeddings and this you, you take care of. So you can either use a, a, a pre-trained transformer from Hugging Face, or you can fine tune it to your own use case and data set or use your own model. You generate the embeddings and then you can find uh, uh, the similar vectors for your vector similarity search. And uh, we, we, we support two uh, algorithms. One is the brute force one, the flat, a KNN, K near, nearest neighbor, that basically search across every vector. And the, and the second one, which is much more efficient, is the ANN or HNSW. And there are many, this is one of them that we support. And uh, it balances uh, performance with accuracy, and it's a very good one. And there are several methods of uh, measuring the distance. And we support uh, uh, L2, cosine, and the uh, in, uh, internal product of two vectors. And we support both uh, um, uh, similar vector queries, but 
and hybrid queries which similar vectors together with filters. And what do we mean by that? So let's say we have an image uh, or, or uh, an item in the product catalog, which is in the top right corner here. And uh, now I want to perform a, a search. Let's say I uh, uploaded an image of a shirt and I want to find uh, the item that is here in the top corner, which is uh, this blue shirt. Uh, and, and this blue shirt has vector uh, embedding of images. And I uploaded my own image uh, of, of the shirt. And I like to find the, the, the 10 uh, most similar uh, images uh, to the image I uploaded. So here you can see uh, the, the syntax of this uh, query. Uh, now, if I, and, and the product is the index here. And now if I wanted uh, also to filter those results, uh, so I, I'll get a result of uh, at the same time of, of the top most similar uh, products, but also at the range of the price 10 to $20. And that are also uh, close, the store is also close to where I am, and that it's sorted by price in ascending order. So the cheapest uh, shirts first, I would use this query, which basically uses the, the regular um, ready search uh, syntax that Simon showed you. And, and this is, a, a, you know, just a few lines of code. We transformed Redis or ready search into a vector database. So this is really cool. Uh, and with the OM uh, client, we can even make it simpler. Um, and uh, so, so this is basically how uh, we're, we're using uh, Redis as a vector database. Now, uh, if I wanted to summarize the key benefits of using Redis as a vector database for vector similarity search, so here we have those. So you can run queries where your data live. So often, uh, customers tell us, yeah, we have the vectors already in Redis, and then we extract them into another, you know, a startup uh, that has a vector database and perform the vector similarity uh, search there. So you don't need to do that anymore. You save valuable data and the time that it takes to extract, you know, millions of vectors. And uh, you reduce your technical depth instead of having different technology for every uh, use case for a database, if it's a document or time series or graph and now vector database, you can use just one Redis, you know, the, with the, the track record for real time uh, use cases at scale. And this really reduces your technical debt. And it's uh, ideal uh, for real time use cases. Run neural search, it's a speed of Redis with very low latency. This is what we excel in. Uh, we excel uh, in scaling that and we're doing it very efficiently. So these are the key benefits of uh, using uh, Redis as a vector database for uh, vector similarity search. And you can find more information about it by check, checking out resources on redis.com. Uh, and so uh, if I'll uh, just uh, uh, summarize uh, uh, the presentation, uh, we, we saw that real-time AI ML is on the rise and that online feature stores and vector similarity search are key for deploying them at scale. In-memory key value database uh, are ideally suited as the infrastructure for high-scale real-time AI ML use cases. And we saw how uh, Redis is used for uh, online feature store and for neural, uh, neural search. And you can check our resources for both Redis and Redis Enterprise, and we're gonna share the links with you soon. Uh, and so we have blog posts, case studies, benchmarks, demos, and quick start tutorials for getting started with feature stores and vector similarity search. And of, there is also the Redis University for a deep dive on Redis, Redis IO website, uh, Redis blog, and redis.com. Uh, and to check out the upcoming events and resources. And stay tuned for more Redis courses coming from Data Science Dojo. And all of these resources that I mentioned, uh, we are gonna share with you by the end of the recording and also links uh, to the YouTube, uh, uh, the recording on YouTube. And so with that, I would like to hand over uh, the presentation uh, to Taimur for Q&A. Thank you very much for listening. Thanks so much, Nava. Thank you so much, Simon, for the great presentation. I hope this was beneficial for the group and the audience here. 
Uh, we've actually shared a link to the certificate. So if you want to be able to fill that out, uh, now's the time to do that. Uh, we had a few questions on the uh, chat session, which we've answered, but I'd like to open it up and see if there are any live questions from the audience. So now would be a good time to ask some of those questions. So I'll turn it over to uh, folks that are dialed into Zoom if there are any questions folks have. So there's one question that actually just came on the Q&A system and I'll read it here. Uh, does Redis support distributed paradigm when key value database can't be fit in a single machine? So why don't I direct that over to Simon? Did you want to take that question? Oh yeah, so the problem here is that we said the entire data set for Redis has to fit into RAM because that's where all the reads come from. So obviously you eventually hit a, uh, a size limit on a single machine. And the way that Redis um, deals with that is there's a clustering solution for the open source product. And in enterprise, it's kind of handled automatically for you with a proxy. And the database is basically sharded out across multiple different servers. And there's a mapping kept of what keys live on which server. Um, so you sort of get more memory by spraying the database out over servers. This also obviously gives you some level of redundancy as well. No, thank you so much for that question, for that answer, Simon. Uh, there was another question here uh, just about getting access to more courses and more training content uh, for Redis. And so maybe I could turn that back to either uh, Simon or Nava about that. So I can ask that. Go for it. Okay, so uh, we have uh, many uh, resources um, which you can get a deep dive on all of these uh, subjects. Uh, you can uh, go to Redis University, you can look for quick start tutorials, and uh, we are planning to have uh, more courses with Data Science Dojo. And we are gonna share uh, links to some of these resources by the end of this presentation and in the links to the YouTube, YouTube uh, recording uh, on YouTube. Yeah, and if I can just jump in on that, um, we have a whole host of uh, resources that uh, Nava and Simon have shared with us. And so um, we're gonna post some of the links now, and then uh, we'll make sure that with the recording, as well as on YouTube or LinkedIn, uh, we'll have all those links made available, whether it's in the description or in a resources tab. No, that sounds great. Well, I know we're uh, at the top of the hour and there are a couple more questions that came in. And so we'll follow up with those questions offline. Um, I do wanna take this opportunity to thank everyone that joined. It was a pleasure being able to present on the topic to you all. Uh, really like to thank Fatima Rafiq for setting up everything. There's a lot of work that goes into scheduling these webinars. So huge thanks to her for making that available. Uh, on behalf of Data Science Dojo, I just wanted to share that we have a next webinar, uh, which is AI and ML workflows with Kubernetes. Uh, that's going to be aired tomorrow at 10 a.m. Pacific uh, with Natalie uh, Vinto from Red Hat OpenShift. Um, finally, once again, thank you so much for the opportunity to Data Science Dojo and the attendees. Uh, Nathan, I'll turn it over to you. All right, perfect. And uh, just for the certificate reasons, we're gonna stay on for just a couple of minutes. Um, but if you already got that, feel free to jump off. Uh, and thank you everyone for joining. Thank you, uh, Redis, everyone from Redis for, for being here today. Absolutely. Thank you, thank you for Thanks listening. So much. Bye bye. Thank you. thank you for hosting us. <laughs>